All right, grab your Bibles, 1 Samuel. If you remember, two weeks ago, um, we were looking at the story of the Ark of God. So let's review really quick. The Israelites are the good guys. They're fighting against the Philistines, the bad guys. They go into battle. The Philistines beat up on the good guys. The Israelites, the good guys, get the idea, let's bring God into the battle. Let's get the Ark of the Covenant, which many of you now realize that of all the churches in the world, Life Point Alliance is the, is the uh, overseer of the Ark of God. Now, if you think this is a real ark, see me afterwards, okay? <laughs> so they get the idea, and the Ark of God, God's presence was enthroned. What was, it, what was this part, the lid, called? The seat of mercy or the atonement cover. And so it was, in a sense, it was God's earthly throne. There's an ark in heaven. Um, this was the ark on earth was made as a model of the ark in heaven. And God's presence was in between the cherubim. Moses would speak to God from his glory. So it was the presence, and they had to carry the ark of God with these, with these poles that went into it. And so they bring the ark of God into battle. They're like, how can we lose? But they go to war against the Philistines, and they do lose. The Israelites lose, and the ark of God is captured by the enemy. God becomes a POW, a prisoner of war. And so they take the ark of God to one of the Philistine cities, Ashdod, and they bring him into the temple of Dagon. And they go, Dagon, you've conquered a new God, the God of the Israelites. And they park the Lord there, okay? And they're like, Dagon, you are powerful and mighty. The next morning, when the people wake up and go to the temple of Dagon, what do they find? What do they find? Dagon is on his face worshiping the God of the Israelites. They're like, Dagon, what are you doing? You can't do that. They put them back up, glue them, cement them, tie them up, nail them in. Don't disappoint us again. The next morning when they get up, what happened? Dagon was down again, worshiping the God of the Israelites, but this time his head and his hands were broken off. Okay? The people of Ashdod are a wreck. Now, let's come back to the ark for a second. What The ark is like a chest. What is inside the ark? The Ten Commandments, the golden jar of manna, and Aaron's staff that had budded. And so let me go over the title of my sermon for you. What will it be, mercy or judgment? Or, did you, this is my humorous title. Did you hear about the time God got a ride home from two females? I know, you're like, whoa, what? Just remember that. Did you hear about the time God got a ride home by two females? Okay, we'll come back to that. But let's, let's talk about the ark here for a second. There's three things that were in the ark, and we're told about them in Hebrew. The ark, I have it in yellow. The ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of, of the covenant. Now, and it is with, believe me, with reverence that I remove the lid, okay? So, the ark is very symbolic, and I have a whole message on it. I've never preached it here, but the, this whole ark represents Jesus Christ. The ark was made of wood, which represents the humanity of Jesus, totally covered with gold, which represents the divinity of Jesus. Inside the ark, of course, were the Ten Commandments. If you ever want to know how they look, here they are, Okay. <laughs> So I, I think you thought they were a lot bigger, didn't you? So that's, this is the core of who God is. This is his holiness. It's the core of Christ who never sinned, kept the commandments perfectly. 
So it speaks of Jesus' holiness. Then inside the ark, which again speaks of Jesus, is the golden jar of manna. The Israelites were fed manna for 40 years. It came from heaven. It's the food of angels. In Revelation, it talks about that when we get to heaven, we get to try some of this delicious manna that is the best food in the universe. So, but the manna speaks of Jesus because Jesus said in the Gospel of John, Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. So just as they physically got nourished by manna for 40 years, so Jesus is our spiritual food. He gives us spiritual life. And then inside the ark was Aaron's staff that had blossomed. Now, I want you to come with me to number 17 in your Bible. So you got to back up um, to the beginning of the Old Testament and look for number 17. And I want to talk about, now this staff isn't really good because this would be like a staff that maybe you would use to walk with. So unless Aaron was very small. Um, so let's look at number 17. And let me read to you the story about the staffs. I have to tell you that the, that the leaders of each of the 12 tribes were constantly like, who should be the leader? I think I should be the leader. Who made him the leader? Everyone should follow me. I should be the spiritual leader. And they're constantly bickering and fighting among the 12 leaders of the 12 tribes who the people should follow. And God gets fed up with it. So chapter 17, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and get 12 staffs from them, one from the leader of each of the ancestral tribes. So each one, hand over your dead wooden staff. Write the name of each man on his staff. On the staff of Levi, write Aaron's name. For there must be one staff for the head of each ancestral tribe. Place them in the tent of meeting in front of the Ark of the Covenant Law. So... Moses took the 12 staffs of all the leaders who were competing and he puts them in front of the ark. The staff, verse 5, the staff belonging to the man I choose will sprout and I will rid myself of this constant grumbling against you by the Israelites. So Moses spoke to the Israelites and their leaders gave him 12 staffs. One for the leader of each of the ancestral tribes, and Aaron's staff was among them. Moses placed the staffs before the Lord in the tent of the covenant law. The next day, Moses entered the tent and saw that Aaron's staff, which represented the tribe of Levi, had not only sprouted, but had budded, blossomed, and produced almonds. Then Moses brought out all the staffs from the Lord's presence to all the Israelites. They looked at them, and each of the leaders took his own staff. The Lord said to Moses, put back Aaron's staff in front of the Ark of the Covenant to be, as, to be kept as a sign to the rebellious. This will put an end to their grumbling against me so that they will not die. Moses did just as the Lord commanded him. So at some point they put the staff that had blossomed and budded in front of the Ark, but eventually it winds up inside the Ark. Now... And this was to end the quarreling among all the leaders who should be the spiritual leaders that they should follow. And it fell to the tribe of Levi, and the priests would come from the tribe of Levi. I want to suggest to you that this staff also represents Jesus Christ. So I want to give you another test, very similar, in that everyone in the world, the world's very rebellious, and everyone is like, what leader should we follow? And I want to suggest that every leader r would give their body as a dead staff. So Buddha says, everyone should follow me. Okay, Buddha, you bring your dead body. That will be your staff. Confucius, Confucianism, 
Everyone should follow me. I should be the spiritual leader. Okay, you, you bring forth your dead body too. Jesus says everyone should follow me. Okay, Jesus, you, you know, you bring your dead body. We'll crucify you on the cross, and you're dead in the tomb. Mohammed, Joseph Smith, and on and on, all these staffs of, well, who is going to be the leader? Who does God say is the spiritual leader that we should follow? But there's only one of those who resurrected from the dead. There is only one staff that blossomed and came forth from the grave. I think this is a no-brainer. It's like a no-brainer to the world. Just as God said, it's the tribe of Levi I chose, God said, there is one. There's only one that rose from the dead and is still alive, and that's the one you should follow. Why would any of you follow a dead person who claimed to have all spiritual insight and all that stuff when they're dead in the grave? There's only one that came out of the grave, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. So, this represents Jesus Christ. I serve a risen Savior. So, let's put that back there. Okay, so now let's, let's get back into the story. Back in 1 Samuel. God's a POW. He's in Dagon's temple. Verse, chapter 5, 1 Samuel, verse 6. The Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod and its vicinity. He brought devastation on them and afflicted them with tumors. I don't know if they were boils, cancerous tumors. And I'm like, hey, I've been there. I've, I've you know, got cancer twice that the Lord has used doctors and radiation to kill, and I hope they don't come back. So verse 7, when the people of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, the ark of God of Israel must not stay here with us because his hand is heavy on us and on Dagon our God. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines, there's five of them, and they asked them, what shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? So they got this meeting in the, in the squares where the five main cities of the Philistines, the, the enemy. And so Ashdod originally got the ark, but they're all dying. They're getting tumors. Dagon keeps worshiping God, and they're like, we got to get rid of them. So they have a meeting with the five mayors of those towns. And I just picture, I picture a very pride mayor from Gath. Because it says here, they, what shall we do with the ark of God? They answered, have the ark of the God of Israel moved to Gath. So they moved the Ark of God of Israel. I can just see the mayor in Gath going, I don't know what's wrong with you people in Ashdod. You guys are ridiculous thinking that the God of the Israelites is stronger than Dagon. You guys, your faith is weak. You guys are a bunch of crybabies. Our God, our Dagon, and our temple in Gath is stronger. We'll take the Ark of God. We're not afraid of the God of of the Israelites. Move them into our temple. Boy, do they have to learn a lesson. Verse 9. But after they they had it moved in, the Lord's hand was against that city, throwing it into great panic. He afflicted the people of the city. I thought this is interesting, both young and old. So, you know, everyone's getting the the tumors. So, they don't have another meeting. Gath just says, send it on to the next city. They don't even tell the the Ekron. They're going to move it to Ekron now. They don't even tell them. They're like, just send it on. So, it now moves to Ekron. As the ark of God was entering Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, they have brought the ark of the God of Israel around to kill us and our people. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and said, send the ark of the God of Israel away. Let it go back to its own place or it will kill us and our people. For death has filled the city with panic. God's hand was very heavy on it. Those who did not die were afflicted with tumors and the outcry of the city went up to heaven. Whew, I think God can take care of himself, right? So they now want to send God back to Israel. It's too bad that they didn't say, you know what? Let's get rid of Dagon. 
Obviously, the God of the Israelites is the God that we should all follow. He is the most powerful and, you know, but no, they don't do that. It's too bad. It's like so many people, like, just get rid of Jesus. Get, you know, we're not interested, even though he is the powerful Lord of lords and King of kings. Chapter 6, verse 1, when the ark of the Lord had been in Philistine territory, so how long was God a POW, supposedly? Seven months, okay? So he's, he's been away seven months, teaching the enemy some lessons. The, verse 2, the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners and said, what shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it back to its place. They answered, if you return the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it back to him without a gift. Well, I'm going to skip down to verse 7. I'm down to verse 7. So they're going to send the ark of God back, and they get... And, Here's their idea. Here's what they do. Verse 7. Now then, get a new cart ready, a new, v- a new car, okay? With two cows that have calved and have never been yoked. Hitch the cows to the cart, but take their calves away and pen them up. Take the ark of the Lord and put it on the cart and in a chest beside it, put the gold objects you're sending back to him as a guilt offering. Send it on its way, but keep watching it. If it goes up to its own territory toward Beth Shemesh, then the Lord has brought this great disaster on us. But if it does not, then we will know that it was not his hand that struck us, but that it happened to us by chance. So verse 10, so they did this. They took two such cows and hitched them to the cart and penned up their calves. By the way, let me give you a picture here. There we go. Did I not tell you that one of the sermon titles was, did you not hear about the time God got a ride home with two females? (laughs) You thought I was kidding, huh? (laughs) So they got these two cows, just had given birth, so they knew, and they never had a cart on them, so they knew that the cows wouldn't move They would want to stay with their babies. So verse 11, they placed the ark of the Lord on the cart and along with it the chest contained the gold rats, the models of the tumors. Then the cows went straight up toward Beth Shemesh, keeping on the road and lowing. I think they were crying that they wanted to be with the babies, their babies, but all their lowing all the way, they did not turn to the right or the left. The rulers of the Philistines followed them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. So this, this is a little diagram, by the way, to give you the path of the ark. I, I call this God's vacation. So they're, they're battling in Ephek and Ebenezer. Number one, the, the Philistines and Israelites are camped at, the, the Israelites are in um, Ebenezer, and the Philistines are in Ephek. Then they decide to go to Shiloh to get the ark of God. They bring the ark of God into battle. They lose. The ark of God is then taken to Ashdod, put into the temple of Dagon. They get, they get punished and disciplined. They send the ark to Gath. They get worked over. And then they just send it to Ekron. And now with, put on the cart, two cows, and it goes back to Beth Shemesh. So God went on holiday for seven months. And now he's coming back. Now, how do you think the Israelites feel? God's been gone. <laughs> For seven months. And now he comes back to Israel. How do you think they are feeling in Beth Shemesh in Israel with God returning? They are pretty happy. I mean, the ark is the whole center of their worship. Without an ark, it's like, how do you have sacrifices for your sins? And so, you know, the presence of God was gone. So they are excited. It reminds me of the second coming of Jesus Christ. So we read, verse 13, now the people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting their wheat in the valley, and when they looked up and saw the ark, they rejoiced at the sight. It so reminds me, Jesus says, two men will be in the field harvesting, just like the Israelites are harvesting. And Jesus Christ comes back. One is taken and the other is left. Two women will be grinding the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. There'll be great celebration for the believers. 
Verse 14. The cart came to the field of Joshua. And by the way, Joshua is another name for Jesus. Of Beth Shemesh. And there it stopped beside a large rock. And some people say, oh, that's the rock of Jesus' grave that he burst forth from. So let's jump down. So they're, they're excited. But now I have to tell you this, like, and it's what the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark is based on. I have to tell you this very shocking story about the ark being returned to Israel. And it starts in verse 19. It says, but God struck down some of the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, putting, now in the NIV, I've got 70 of them to death because they looked into the ark of the Lord. Now, some of you have a different number. What number do you have in your Bibles if you don't have 70? Anyone? have a different version with a different number? 50,070. 50, now, I'm going to share with something with you about Bible translators and why they had a problem translating the Hebrew that says 50,070. In fact, if you look at the footnote, if you have an NIV, there should be a little footnote next to that number. 70, I, in my version, I have a little A. Look at the footnote for verse 19. Do you, do you see the footnote? Do you notice it says a few Hebrew... This, this is like, wow, this makes no sense. A few Hebrew manuscripts, and then it goes, most Hebrew manuscripts, in fact, and the Septuagint have the number, what? 50,070. <laughs> That's what the number is in the Hebrew. <laughs> now, here's what the Bible scholars did, and it's like, what is wrong with, you know, this is like, first of all, the Bible scholars go, it can't be 50,070, because through our research, and we're talking like 3,000 years ago, um, we believe that there was only 40,000 people that lived in Beth Shemesh. So how could it be 50,070 were put to death when we think only 40,000 lived in Beth Shemesh? I'm like, how do you know only 40,000 lived in Beth Shem Did they have records? Did you check out the gravestones? And they're like, well, we, you know, we, we do calculations. And I'm like, baloney, you have no idea how many people lived in Beth Shemesh at that time. 40,000? What if it was 50,070? And here's another fact to keep in mind. The ark of God, this is the center of, of you know, the religion. Uh, it's the presence of God. If the ark of God appears in the field, do you think anyone else in Israel might show up to see the ark of God? When there's a great concert in Pittsburgh, do you know that tens of thousands of people from the surrounding community will all go to Pittsburgh to watch a game or to hear a concert or whatever? God has just come back. In fact, the people, most of the people of Israel, have never seen the Ark of God because the Ark of God was kept in the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies. So now the news is out. Come to Beth Shemesh and you can see the Ark of God and his glory. You're not telling, so don't tell me, even if Beth Shemesh had only 40,000, that the people were flocking to see the ark of the Lord. So then the commentaries, the people that decide, it can't be 50,070, that's just, it's incomprehensible because they go, there's no way God would put that many people to death. We, we just, we, that just irks us to think that God would put 50,070 people to death. That, 70 sounds a lot nicer. God put 70 people to death. Yeah, let's go with that number, okay? I'm like, oh. and I will share with you in a second why that number is probably correct, the 50,070. So why did God put 50,070 people to death? Because they did what? 
they opened up the ark and did what? And they looked in it. So let's talk about this for a second. Now, first of all, let's, if you read this, not everyone looked into it because there were people left in Beth Shemesh that were mourning and crying when they saw 50,070 dead bodies. Have you ever, so play with me here. I'm, here's what I think happened, and I know I'm reading between the lines. The ark of God has come back. Now, the question that you might have, that the Israelites might have at Beth Shemesh is, hey, I wonder if the Ten Commandments and the golden jar of manna and Aaron's staff that had budded, blossomed, I wonder if they're in there, in that chest. Maybe we should check out that the Philistines didn't open that chest and take the Ten Commandments out. Don't you think we should check to see if they're in there yet? What do you think? You're all very quiet. <laughs> yeah, I think. And besides that, besides that, you know, we have not seen the Ten Commandments since Moses got them about 500 years ago. Wouldn't you be interested in seeing the Ten Commandments for yourself? Yeah. That would be amazing to look at those Ten Commandments. Now, you know, when people die that are, you know, kings and queens and famous movie stars or pastors, <laughs> no, I'm you've seen that they'll have their funeral at the church for days where people will pass by. They have lines of people that are passing by to give their last respect. And, and hundreds of thousands of people, depending on who it is, will pass by for days looking at the person that's laid out in the church. Have you ever seen that? They show them on the news and they talk about, look at the lines of people. Well, I think there was a long line to look at the Ten Commandments. In fact, it had 50,070 people in it. And they're lined up to take a look at the Ten Commandments. So they're going by. Now, I don't think they died right, boom, when they looked at it. Because think to yourself, if you're in this long line of 50,000, and the first person that looked in it drops dead, what are you doing? <laughs> Stepping on their body so you can be the second one dead. I mean, at some point, you'd be like, I don't think we should go look at that, right? So I have a funny feeling the 50,070 looked at it, and then when they were all done, they're like, hey, you know what? Why am I getting this tumor boil on me? What's, you know, and then, you know. But not all of them. Not all of them looked. Because, you see, there were some people that must have read their Bibles. Because if you had read your Bible, you would have known not to do that. So, in Numbers 4, Moses is giving instructions, and and. This is to the Kohathite tribal clans. The Levites were made up of three groups. This is one group of the Levites, and their job was to oversee the furnishings of the tabernacle. So the Lord said, See that the Kohathite tribal clans are not destroyed from among the Levites, because they're going to have a special role of caring for the furnishings when they get moved, so that they may live and not die when they come near the most holy things. Do this for them. Aaron and his sons are to go into the sanctuary and assign to each man his work and what he is to carry when they were going to move the tabernacle. But the Kohathites must not go in to look at the holy things, even for a moment, or they will die. So there were some people in Beth Shemesh that knew, wait a second, I think Moses warned about looking at the holy things even for a second, even for a moment or you will die. We're not doing it. We're not doing it. So, let's come back to the ark for a second because I want to share with you what they, the error they made, which is they removed the atonement cover 
or, or what's called the mercy seat from the top of the ark. Now, does anyone know, let me go back to this one here. There's something missing on this picture of the ark. What is missing? What? Not the angels, that's the two cherubim. They were made out of gold. What is missing that would have been on that ark? It would not have been pretty. The blood. The blood. There would be blood. Every year, Aaron went in, once a year, sacrificed a lamb or bull, and sprinkled blood on that ark, on that mercy seat. The atonement cover, which speaks to cover over our sins. So here's the verse. Whoops. This is just one example. Aaron would present his bull for an absolution offering to make atonement, to cover for himself and his household. He will slaughter his bull for the absolution offering. He will take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before God and two handfuls of finely ground aromic, aromatic, aromatic. Let's go with Pastor Paul. Incense and bring them inside the curtain and put the incense on the fire before God. The smoke of the incense will cover the atonement cover, which is over the testimony, the Ten Commandments, so that he doesn't die. He will take some of the bull's blood and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the atonement cover, then sprinkle the blood before the atonement cover seven times. And I preached a sermon about how Jesus shed his blood seven times. The first time was in the Garden of Gethsemane when he sweat drops of blood to do God's will, to go to the cross and suffer hell for us. That's sprinkling number one. Sprinkling number two is when Jesus was whipped by his stripes, we are healed. Sprinkling number three is when they pulled the beard out of Jesus' face. Sprinkling number four is the, the thorn of crowns on his head. Sprinkling number five is when the nails went through his hand. Sprinkling number six is the nails through his feet. And sprinkling number seven is when they took the sword up into his heart and the blood. That blood was sprinkled Jesus' blood on the heavenly ark up in heaven. Romans 5, 9, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So God has a holy, he's got his holy laws, and he has wrath. He's a, he's a, a righteous God, and you can only, <laughs> you know, we are saved by the penalty. What is the penalty for sinning? The wages of sin is death. So, he, Ephesians, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Hebrews 9, but when Christ came as high priest, of the good things that are now already here. He went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle. Moses was told, he, he made a copy of the one in heaven. There's a real one up in heaven. He went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle. That is not made with human hands. That is to say, it's not a part of this creation. He, and so he goes to the heavenly tabernacle. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves of the Old Testament, which were all pointing to Jesus, but he entered the most holy place in heaven once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Wow, so that there's a heavenly ark in Revelation and the blood of Jesus is on that ark, on that atonement cover that forgives us of our sins. There are two ways to get to heaven. Sometimes you will hear people say there's only one way to get to heaven through Jesus Christ who pays for your sins because our sins deserve death. God can only let us into heaven if we're holy like he is holy. In fact, look at 1 Samuel chapter 6 again there and look at verse 20. And the people of Beth Shemesh asked, who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this what? This holy God. Who can go to heaven to stand before a holy God? There's two ways. Two ways to get to heaven. 
Way number one is what Jesus says here in Matthew 548. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So if you're perfect and you have no sins, you can go to heaven. Okay? That's option one. How many of you would like to take option one? Okay. I'm not convinced anyone can do option one, right? Yeah. So let's talk about option two, <laughs> which is that it's by the blood. It's, it's, it's what the whole Old Testament was teaching when they would sacrifice a lamb. It's by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus took our sins upon himself on the cross, suffered hell in our place. So he takes our sins and he gives us his righteousness so we are holy. It's, it's if we did not sin because Christ says, Father, I will pay for the sin. I, punish me for their sin. Now, there's... Here's the error that the people of Beth Shemesh made. See, when you take the blood off, when you take the atonement cover off, so here's God's presence, right? So they take the blood off, and you now reveal the Ten Commandments. In a sense, with that lid on there, God was like, okay, I don't see the consequences it, the sin has been paid for by the sacrifice of the bulls. They, there's, you know, that blood covers the penalty for breaking the commandments. But now they removed the lid. And God sees his righteous law again. And he sees the 50,070 people that pass in front of him. And what does God decide when he sees people that no longer the blood speaks forgiveness and covers atonement, no longer covers over their sin? When God sees his commandments and sees the people, they are going to hell just like that. He's a holy God. You can't stand before him on your own. That, that was a mistake to take the lid off of the Ten Commandments that speak of forgiveness. By the way, you have this choice in the future. It's the same truth. In the future, you have a choice. You can either go, oh no, I'm, I'm coming by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm making Jesus my savior, my lamb, so that my sins are covered. Or you can go, no, no, I'm not interested in the blood. Take the lid off. I'll take my chances that I'm good enough to get to heaven. I'll take my chances before the Ten Commandments. If you give your heart to Jesus, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That he, he dies for our sins. He offers the gift of salvation, but you have to receive it. He's not going to force it on you. You have to receive Jesus and, and what he's done for you. Or, or you go, no, no, I'll... I'm not interested in the blood. I'll stand before the Ten Commandments. Well, that's, here's what's going to happen at the end of time before God creates a new heaven and a new earth. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence. It reminds me of the, that was his earthly throne. And there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, just like all those 50,070 people passing in front of the throne. And books were open. That's the record of your life. Another book was open, which is the book of life. That's the people that asked Jesus to be their savior. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the gave dead up that, the dead were, that were in them. And each, each person, person was judged according, judged according to what, what they had done. done. Then death and Hades, Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire, the lake of fire, the of fire is the second death. death. Anyone, Anyone whose name, whose name was not found, was not found written in the lake of fire was thrown into the lake of fire. So, so you either, either because, because listen, listen when you stand, when you stand before, before God, God, God say, I'm not interested in the blood forget I <laughs> I think I'm good enough. When God starts going through the Ten Commandments and revealing your life and go, hmm, look how many times you put other things before God. You deserve death for for the disrespect you have shown me by worshiping so many other things. Look how many times you've used the Lord's name in vain. Look how many times you've broken 
my special Sabbath. Look how many times you have not honored your parents or honored older men as fathers, older women as mothers, younger men as brothers, younger women as sisters. Look how many times you have killed. Jesus said, if you're angry at someone, you've committed murder in your heart. Um, so just think, when God reveals, look how many times you were angry and destroyed and killed someone's reputation or their life or messed with them, and God reveals you, stuff you don't even remember that God says, let me show you how many times if you had a gun in your hand, you would have shot someone or, you know, you've... And let's, let's look at the sexual immorality in your life, and let's look at the lust and all the things that you've done. Let's look how many times you've lied. They say the average person lies three times a day. You have hundreds of thousands of lies that you deceive people. Let's, not only are we going to look at your actions, we're going to, I'm going to reveal your motives. I'm going to reveal the motives behind what even looks like you did good things. We're going to look at the motives, and you're going to see how selfish you were and how prideful and arrogant and how you thought, oh, I'm so smart, I'm so rich, I'm so brilliant, I'm so good-looking, I deserve God's going to let me into heaven, and God's going to reveal you are selfish, so self-centered, you can't be in my presence. You are going to hell, and you're going to know you deserve that. I don't think it's a good option, to be honest with you. Now, there's t different levels of penalty in hell. That's why you get judged. But don't remove the lid. It's the blood that saves us. It's, we, Jesus made atonement and covered over our sins, paying the price for us. But you have to give your heart to the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. And if you're here this morning... I just so recommend that you give your heart to Jesus Christ. You ask him. He died for you. He paid the penalty. The Old Testament tabernacle is done away with with Jesus. Give your heart to the Lord and make him your savior. I'll pray a prayer out loud. You pray along with me. Lord Jesus, I come to you confessing that I am a sinner and I'm not a holy person that deserves to be in heaven. But thank you, Jesus, for being the sacrificial lamb that has taken my sins upon himself. Forgive me. And Jesus, I ask you to come into me. I was made to have fellowship with God. So Jesus, I open my heart and ask you to be my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your presence. Thank you that I can stand in heaven one day because I'm clothed in your righteousness and not my own. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I always like to pray a prayer of blessing upon those of you who prayed that prayer with me. Um, I'm not going to embarrass anyone with heads bowed, Christians praying. If you prayed that prayer with me to ask Jesus into your heart, I would like you to just lift your hand up and then put it down after I see you. And then I want to pray for you. So, God bless you, brother. Anyone else? I don't want to miss anyone. God bless you. I see two. You can put your hand down. I see you. Anyone else? Father, I pray for these two men here this morning. And may they sense your presence in their life like never before. Um, that they belong to the family of God, that they have become sons of the living God. And Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may you move upon them. May they know from this day forward, may you do things in their life that they really realize that you have moved into their heart and that they are a new individual. It's like they've been born again into God's family. May your spirit come upon them, protect them, Lord. In your name we pray, amen.